Take a book down from the shelf And what with programs on the air I keep pretty much to myself Mr. Saturday Dance Heard the crowded the floor Couldn't bear it without you Don't get around much anymore Good evening. The name, please. Oliver Novel Hardy. Now, what's your name? Sir Stanley Laurel. Laurel and Hardy are the world's most famous comedy double act. They made over a hundred films together between 1927 and 1953. And half a century later, they're still as popular as ever. As soon as you saw the first Laurel and Hardy film, it just stuck with you. You knew about Laurel and Hardy after that. It's called comedy. I think they're just definitive. Laurel and Hardy was kind of like a family favourite in our house. They were hilarious. But the real Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy were complex people whose private lives were very much at odds with their on-screen personas. One of the great myths about Laurel and Hardy um, is that they were the same people on screen and off. The point about Lol and Hardy's about many comedians was that they made their various fears and anxieties and flaws into art. Well, here's another nice mess you've gotten me into. If you're in Los Angeles today and you're on the trail of the real Laurel and Hardy, there's only one man to call. Bob Satterfield is a man on a mission. In 1980, we put together the uh, tour of the locations and their comedies just as fresh today uh, in the year 2002. And it's really a great high and energetic when you find one of the locations and you knew that Laurel and Hardy actually you know, walked on these steps or they filmed uh, part of their history doing that. Uh, that's really quite amazing to, to have that feeling once you find them. But our search for the real Stan Laurel starts not in Hollywood, but in Northern England, where Stan Laurel, or Stan Jefferson as he was christened, was born in the market town of Ulverston in 1890, the eldest son of a family with a strong theatrical tradition. Stan's father, A.J. Jefferson, was a playwright, he was a, a comedian. In fact, Stan's uh, birth certificate uh, has as the uh, profession of father comedian. And so Stan was simply brought up in the business. He was backstage a lot, and uh, he, of, of course, adored the, the comics. They, they were his idols, and he would watch them from backstage and determine very early that that's exactly what he was going to do. Though his father wanted him to be a theater manager, Stan was already headstrong enough to want to follow him onto the stage, despite the insecurities of a life in vaudeville. It was hard work going to traveling all over the country all the time. And, and you know, of course, then you've got to fix up trying to get digs somewhere. I mean, I'd many times have got to the theater and I hadn't got any digs. I got nowhere to sleep that night. But Stan was determined enough to get an audition at his father's theater in Glasgow without his father's knowledge. So up went the curtain and Stan got out there, big smile, and there in the front row was his father. Surprisingly, Stan's father was happy to support him, using his theatrical connections to get him a job with Fred Carno's traveling variety show. You would see a, a conjurer, acrobats, dancers, singers, all different people, and it, it, it was such a variety, and that was why it was called Variety Theatres. And Carno's leading man was a certain Charlie Chaplin. Stan became uh, Charlie Chaplin's understudy, uh, as well as his roommate uh, on, on tour. Well, Stan could do virtually anything that uh, Chaplin could do. When I was very young, and I can't remember why, I met an old man in Leeds, my hometown, He'd worked at the old Hippodrome Theatre, I think, in Leeds, that no longer existed. 
and the Fred Carnot company came and he remembered the principal comedian very well he said he was brilliant and nobody liked him everybody liked his understudy who could do everything he did the star was Charlie Chaplin and the understudy was Stan Laurel while Stan dreamed of following his father as a comedian on the other side of the Atlantic young Norville Hardy's life was forged by his father's premature death when he was just a baby I think young Hardy may well have been to an extent doted on by his mother having lost his father as a baby one of Hardy's half-sisters felt that the boy over ate to compensate for the loss of his father at such an early age. Oliver grows up uh, as the fat boy of a small southern town where it's a very bad idea to be different. Uh, and where the solution is, um, like many kids who are perceived to be different, to try and be popular by any means necessary. I'm sure that deep inside him there's that pain of someone who was bullied and who couldn't do cross-country runs like the rest of the people in his class and didn't get the girls when he was 15 and all those things that, that, that people are confronted with when they have a frame that isn't the supposedly perfect frame. He was not particularly good as a scholar. Um, at one point he was actually put into a military academy from which he ran away. <laughs> then he'd be pacified after a, a liberal supply of biscuits from his mother. <laughs> but overall, he loved music. And I believe he was temporarily, at least, a student at the Atlanta Conservatory of Music in order to channel this interest. But it was film that really captured the young Oliver's imagination. In 1910, he got a job at the local cinema as an assistant, where he frequently sang to entertain the audiences between films. And he took a look at the various things that were happening on screen and, as he put it later on, felt that he could be as good or as bad as those fellows. Between shows, Ollie began hanging around the Lubin film studios in nearby Jacksonville. In 1914, he got his break as an extra in the comedy They Looked Alike. I think size is always really double-edged for a performer, but you can decide whether or not to make your size work for you. Ollie did just that and became a comedy character actor, using his size to good advantage. But he decided to make one change to his identity. Off duty he was known to family and friends as Babe because <laughs> The, uh, the chaps from the studio would go to a local Italian barber who, as Hardy later put it, was, and I quote, a boy who liked boys. And he took a great interest in young Hardy, particularly these rather baby-like features. He'd give Hardy a shave and then he'd pat powder into his cheeks afterwards saying, nicer baby, nicer baby. And of course the other actors from the studio thought this was hilarious. Uh, they started calling him Baby and teasing him and then it got cut short to Babe and that became his lifelong nickname. Stan had left England in 1912 to tour America with the Carno troupe, but when he got there, he decided to go it alone. He began performing at vaudeville theatres across America. By 1917, he had teamed up with the Australian actress May Dahlberg. May was to have a major influence on Stan. Stan had been planning to change his name anyway because 13 letters, Stan Jefferson. And so May said, we were in the dressing room. As you said, I don't know how I got it, but I had a book of Roman history. And there was a picture of a famous Roman general wearing the laurel. And I said, hey, look, laurel. And so he tried it out, Stan Laurel. She said, he said it for the first time. And he said, yeah, yeah. So that's how he became Stan Laurel. As Stan and May Laurel, the couple headed for America's new entertainment capital, Hollywood, where the filmmakers were churning out an endless stream of cheap and cheerful silent comedies. Because there was, there was no soundtrack, it didn't matter that, that sets could be back to back, side by side, with entirely different things going on. You'd have a, a melodrama being acted out on one set, next door you have got a knockabout comedy being done, and next door to them there'd be a violent robbery with gunshots and heaven knows what else. And it didn't matter because nobody could hear it. 
Stan's vaudeville training was perfect for the physical style of silent comedy films. Babe Hardy also arrived in Hollywood in 1917 and quickly found work as a character actor, appearing in over 50 short films in less than three years. In 1921, Stan and Ollie were brought together for the first time in the film The Lucky Dog. It's interesting to watch the two of them in Lucky Dog because although the characters they're playing bear no resemblance to anything from their mature work, there does seem to be a kind of interaction between them that you would expect more from actors who had known each other for many years. But no one, least of all Stan and Ollie, saw the potential in their pairing. It was another six years before they worked together again. Whilst Ollie continued to enjoy many straight man roles throughout the early 1920s, Stan was still knocking on doors. Stan's determination was to be a success in show business. He wanted a permanent place in movies that seemed the absolute ideal. His case wasn't helped by May's reputation as a difficult and unnecessary part of his act. They had a fairly tumultuous relationship. They fought all the time, like cat and dog. So, in a sense, this did set a kind of template for the type of relationship that Stan Roll would have with his wives later on. Eventually, May was given $1,000 and a one-way ticket back to Australia on the understanding that she would play no further part in Stan's career. We're at the corner of National and Washington Boulevards in Culver City. This is the site of the former Hal Roach Studios. Just beyond these bushes here is where all of the films that Laurel and Hardy made at Hal Roach Studios were shot. Over here is the plaque of the site of the Hal Roach Studios from 1919 to 1963. So we were honored to be able to put that in his honor. By now, both Stan and Ollie were working for top Hollywood producer Hal Roach. In 1926, Roach teamed them together again as a duo in the film Duck Soup. They were together. Then uh, the next picture we gave them a little more together and, and we could really see that this was going to make a team. It's just uh, seeing the two together and how they complemented each other. I mean that they were so entirely different in type and so entirely different in character that after that we teamed them as two comedians. But it was their next film, The Second Hundred Years, which cemented their status as a comedy duo in the minds of the movie-going public. From now on they would always be known as Laurel and Hardy. It was unlike anything else I'd ever seen before. As soon as you saw the first Laurel and Hardy film, it just stuck with you. You knew about Laurel and Hardy after that. If one dominated the other, they wouldn't have been so successful. They just went like that. Chums. The thing about a little guy in front of the camera is that unless you've got a big guy with him, you don't know he's little. When I was doing Blackadder, because Rowan is over six foot, everyone knew I was that small. And one of the perfect things about Laurel and Hardy is those two different sizes. It's not just that Oliver Hardy is big, he's seriously big and it makes that character of Stan Laurel doubly appealing. Stan and Ollie began developing their own distinctive style. The childish crying, the nervous tie twiddle, the bowler hats, all added to their particular comic personalities. As the Laurel and Hardy team developed, they introduced a number of things that would become known as trademarks. Perhaps the best known of these is Oliver Hardy's tendency to look at the camera, breaking one of the cardinal rules of filmmaking. Now, rather importantly, he didn't speak to the camera. 
Thus, he was allowing the audience to step in rather than stepping out of the film himself. I would challenge anybody to tell me who could do a double take better than Oliver Hardy. Who could actually show irritation with the idiot Stan Laurel so wonderfully, just with his eyes and a flap of his jowls. There were so many things that Oliver Hardy could do incredibly well. Stan's uh, hair scratch and bringing up the hair up to a little point uh, happened uh, early on inadvertently in one of the films. He, he took off his hat and the hair was standing up and got a laugh. If you keep your face still as a performer, then the audience starts to empathize with you and runs their own movie. So that when Stan Laurel's face is absolutely still, you invest him with all the things that you think that he's thinking. This is the house that Laurel and Hardy filmed their 1929 silent classic, Big Business. At this particular location, Laurel and Hardy tried to sell Christmas trees in July to actor James Finlayson. Of course, a tit for tat involves up on the porch area, and Laurel and Hardy basically destroy the house, and James Finlayson destroys their Model T car that's parked out in front. The charm of Big Business and the destruction of two things, a, a home and a, a brand new Ford T motor car. That, that Stan said is, uh, we all do, do that in some form or, or other. There are kind of things in Lauren Hardy films that are remarkably subtle, you know, and they kind of understood uh, screen technique, I think, very, very quickly. There's an innocence about the way they work that is more and more appealing when you've been through all the undergrowths of other uh, comedians and comedy and people trying harder and harder for effect and, and trying to do something over trying hard to do something different. And then you see Lauren Hardy and it's like a master class because they take you back to basics. Laurel and Hardy gradually developed a style that depended on doing things quietly uh, almost restfully and that I think is part of the clue to their success in that during those reaction times they became simply more human. Effectively they were kind of children in adult bodies and uh, that was always appealing. Everyone has been a child so everyone could relate to that aspect of them. For um, childlike characters, they can be very, very adult, very assertive, even if they don't take their revenge in quite an adult manner. There's a great story that Hal Roach tells about filming this. They needed a bungalow and they got an employee that uh, lived in this house, got the keys, keys didn't work, so they tore down the, the door because they were going to do it anyway. They filmed for three days, a family pulls up, they scream and faint because their house is here. They weren't the employee. They destroyed the front door and most of the house and got the wrong house. Over the next two years, Stan and Ollie established themselves as a star team, making 21 silent films together. Off camera, their success meant they were now able to afford a Hollywood lifestyle. After dispatching May, Stan had met and married actress Lois Nielsen in 1926, whilst Ollie had married another actress, Myrtle Reeves. The thing was that it's very difficult, I'm sure, to marry somebody who's entirely wrapped up in their work. And I think that the main thing to know about both Stan and Oliver Hardy is they were craft actors essentially the one thing that interested them in life was to act it was to exercise their craft they were not in it for the money 
A new invention in 1929 was to change Hollywood forever. Talking pictures heralded a new cinema era and ended careers for many of the stars of the silent screen. But for Stan and Ollie, sound added a new dimension to their familiar characters. Dear ladies and gentlemen, we present for your entertainment and approval, Laurel and Hardy. Good evening. The name, please. Oliver Novel Hardy. Now what's your name? Sir Stanley Laurel. Not only were they lucky in that the voices suited the characters, they also served an additional purpose in distinguishing their origins. Suddenly, Hardy's natural southern accent was there to complement the southern colonel mannerisms, the gestures. Meanwhile, Stan Laurel's nondescript English accent was flat and bland and seemed to fit in with the, the, the bland idiot image he was cultivating. Oh! Oh! oh. What's the matter? Did you swallow something? I'm a sick man. An awful sick man. Oh, sounds funny to me. You were all right a minute ago. You see... I that... know I was. It hit me all of a sudden. Knocked me right into a heap. They were able to make the transition easily because they were just more than uh, comedians who uh, fell down and uh, uh, dropped their pants and that sort of thing. They were much more than that. They had, there was a sort of agenda, a kind of emotional agenda under their work which was striking and which, which could flourish in sound as well as silently. Sound meant Ollie could show off his beautiful singing voice. In the sky, I ain't had no loving since January, April, June, or July. Snow time, tain no time to stay outdoors and spoon. Shine on, shine on, harvest moon for me and my girl. I think one of the great things about Laurel and Hardy is that their performances span the silent films uh, and the talkies. Uh, my favourite films are the ones where they talk, but where they really got those elements of silent comedian about them. With most of their films, I didn't care for the scripts all that much. I didn't think a lot of the lines were terribly funny. It was the expression on their faces that made them so. They were the epitome of comedians who could actually be funny without having very funny things to, to do or say. Sound also introduced Laurel and Hardy's theme tune, the Cuckoo Song. I made this little silly tune as a radio time signal to count the hours. And Stan Laurel came up and heard it and says, that tune's for me, that's just what I want. That little cuckoo part's just what I like to do. So he says, I'd like to use that for my theme. I says, well, swell. So then I showed him how it was put together. This represents Stan Laurel. It's supposed to be cuckoo. Same thing over. Not very bright. He's dull. He's stupid, see. That's what that means, stupid. And the big one, Babe, is very dominating, see. Arrogant. He's the boss. Like a bugle call in the army. So we put them together. With eight new Laurel and Hardy films in 1930 alone, the pressure was on stand to come up with constantly inventive plots and gag lines. Though on screen Ollie's character may have been the more dominant, off screen Stan was the one in charge. 
Stan had been directing films for Roach since the early 1920s. With the advent of sound, he added script writing to his unofficial duties of director, choreographer and film editor. That is quite a drastic uh, contrast with this little crying innocent you see on the screen. He was the absolute brains behind devising and writing stuff and doing it all, this little innocent simpleton. By the time of the Laurel and Hardy partnership, Oliver Hardy was entirely content to abdicate responsibility to Stan Laurel when it came to who did the directing, who suggested the gags, who handled the business, who made the public announcements, he would leave it to Stan because he had total confidence in him as comic, director, actor, businessman. For Stan, all this work left little time for socialising. I would say Stan was a workaholic. He didn't go to Hollywood parties, although he was certainly invited. He tended to enjoy uh, the company of a few close friends uh, in the business. Socially, he was um, not interested in parties. Ollie, on the other hand, enjoyed the freedom success afforded him. In private life, their interests were not the same at all. Oliver Hardy was the man for the country club. He became a prize-winning golfer, one of the best in Hollywood. <laughs> Every year he would win the Hal Road Studios golf tournament to the point where there was hardly any point in staging it. They knew who'd win. Stan, ever the professional, would use Ollie's weakness for golf to get a better performance out of him in front of the camera. A wonderful part of the comedy process that they have is Hardy looking terribly frustrated at the camera. What Stan did was to hold off the shooting of those shots until about 20 minutes to 3 each day, knowing that by that time they would really be stewing and wanting to get out on the golf course and uh, consequently many of those frustrated camera looks, those angry comic reactions uh, were for real. I don't mind at all that he couldn't think of a gag, that he could hardly find his way to the studio and he would much prefer to play golf than, than uh, rehearse for a film. I don't mind that at all. He was a man who I think Stan would have been very little without him. And I love Stan dearly, but I won't have people saying that Stan was the man behind it all and that without Stan, uh, Hardy would have been nothing. Hardy was technically one of the greatest comedians I've ever seen on the screen. We're at the site of the stairs in which Laurel and Hardy used in the music box, their 1932 film in which they won their only Academy Award. In that film, they took a piano and lugged it up the flight of stairs several times. It has everything that comedy needs, and all of it so efficiently done. It certainly is the best uh, of their short subjects. But there's not a wasted second in it. Would you gentlemen please let me pass? Why, certainly, man. Why, just a moment. In all their films, they're incredibly aspirant. You know, there's no film in which Lauren and Hardy, their aim is to do nothing and have an easy life. You know, they want to have uh, an easy life, but go about it in the most complicated way. The way they do slapstick is very contained, very clever, and very serious. You know, when, they, when they're shifting that piano, it's a real job which they're doing for them. They're not kind of showing off for the camera. This is something that they're doing for them. And when it runs away, it's a real problem. And as a kid, you're sitting there, oh no, what's going to happen?
It was 1932 and Stan and Ollie were now the undisputed kings of comedy, releasing ever more popular films for a global audience. Hal Roach hit upon a simple way of expanding their international audience. By reshooting each film scene for scene in a variety of different languages, with Stan and Ollie reading their lines phonetically from cue cards. Yes, they would have a dialogue coach who would uh, recite the lines and Stan and Babe would, on a blackboard, make their version of it and uh, giving the Spanish or Italian, whatever it is, uh, in their own uh, tones. Como? The translation of Laurel and Hardy films into different languages also meant they were known throughout the world by very different names. In Sweden and Norway, they're known as Helvan and Halvan. In Hungary, Stan is Span. In Poland, Flippy Flap. In Romania, Stan and Brian. In Portugal, O Buka and O Estica. In Greek, Xanapol and Ashnoi. In Egypt, El Tikin, O El Rufein. In Israel, Hashemen, Ve Hareze. And in Turkey, Sishman Ve Zaif. And I remember during the war, like uh, Neapolitans crying out, they'd call out to somebody who they thought was a bit of a fool and say, Way, Walio, Walio. Laurel and Hardy was kind of like a family favourite in our house. Uh, because my parents and my uncle uh, had seen Laurel and Hardy films before they came to this country, um, I was kind of brought up with the Laurel and Hardy thing. It was that kind of weird thing of kind of my parents kind of uh, telling me about India when I was, I was born in London, uh, but telling me about India and saying, well, you know, we had kind of that we had our family there and you know going up to the Himalayas is amazing and the food is wonderful and Laurel and Hardy were funny and we kind of like and it was just it just became part of this ownership of uh, being Indian so uh, I was always slightly surprised and still am when people don't say they don't like Laurel and Hardy and especially Indians because I just think well wait a minute you're Indian you know you it's part of your culture for God's sake Despite the international success of their films, Stan and Ollie didn't realise how famous they really were around the world. So when, in 1932, Stan decided to take Ollie with him on his first return visit to his family in Britain, they were completely unprepared for the reception that awaited them. They ended up turning their holiday into a theatrical tour. There were the most amazing scenes that I only can compare with later years with rock concerts in the early days of the Beatles. The Brigitte, the street in Leeds, was packed outside. There was a queue around the block. A lot of people didn't get in. Uh, and it was just astonishing. Oh, my God, and the audience used to go potty. They were there waiting for them, and as, the, as, as Ollie and, and Sam came on stage, it was, hey, 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 really meet them because they were loved. By the time they returned to the Roach Studios, the film industry was undergoing a new change in direction, with feature-length films replacing shorts at the box office. What are you going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? Yeah. That again. The reason that Hal Roach wanted a change was simply a matter of marketing. He, he saw that short subjects were on the way out and the real future in cinema going was going to be in the double feature. So he wanted his comedians in feature length films or nothing.
Sal and Ollie's move into features saw them embrace a range of styles, from costume drama to western to operetta. Though their feature films were more heavily scripted, Sal and Ollie continued to improvise whenever they could. With the feature length films, they needed more in the way of formal scripting. But even then, they could improvise because, as an example, when they did one of their uh, operettas, Babes in Toyland, they had a young actor, Henry Brandon, playing the villain. And he got onto the set, and this was a, a very expensive feature film. You'd think they had everything prepared in advance, but no. On the set, Stan Laurel says, OK, look, we're going to do this. You do this, babe. Henry, you go over there and do this. And right, off we go. And Brandon was rather puzzled. He, he, he just said to, to Laurel, um, aren't we going to rehearse? And he got the, the reply simply, do you want to spoil it? <laughs> Despite being Roach's biggest stars, Stan and Ollie, unlike Chaplin, were still only paid a flat wage, to Stan's constant irritation and Roach's obvious benefit. I met Hal Roach when he was a hundred, who was their producer, who, uh, <clears throat> we know where the money went. At one time I had trouble with uh, Harley and I told him he was, uh, I had cancelled his contract and uh, I knew he wasn't going <laughs> to let me cancel his contract. He also had fiendish contracts with them that overlapped. Stan's contract would run, run out in October and Ollie's would run out in January, so what were they going to do? It just seemed that somehow or other they, could, they should try greener fields. And after um reuniting for two more films that came out in 1940, uh, Chump at Oxford and Samson Sea, I think just about all concerned we're going to call a halt. The decision to leave Roach may also have been hastened by the expensive alimony Stan and Ollie had begun to pay out. They were both enormously fond of women, particularly Stan who got married endlessly and uh, was an amazing Lothario. Stan was uh, and in respect to women, uh, adored them, uh, chased them. So, in effect, uh, that ultimately, of course, got him in, in trouble. <laughs> Stan's weakness for women made his married life chaotic. In a sense, he became, as his character was, a bit childlike. Uh, in that uh, maybe these were not very adult relationships. After nine years of marriage, Lois finally had enough of his philandering ways and divorced him in 1935. After the divorce with uh, Lois, there came this uh, rather hectic marital period. He next married Ruth Rogers, not once, but twice, in 1935 and in 1941. This was another kind of relationship between a uh, successful, quite successful by that time, uh, Hollywood star uh, uh, and a woman who was very pretty and very personable and very charming, but essentially didn't really have a career of her own, and so became a kind of second stringer and was not that happy to be in that sort of relationship. And then he married this uh, incredible, uh, what would you call her, performer, I guess, named Ileana, the Russian lady. And I think it's safe to say that he was driven to drink by this formidable lady. Stan's past also caught up with him when his old vaudevillian partner Mae Dahlberg paid him an unexpected visit. She came back to this country and Stan by that time was famous and she sued him uh, on the grounds that um, she was Mrs. Stan Laurel, in fact, if not legally. And she wanted a portion of his earnings. And uh, she got a portion of his earnings. Oliver Hardy wasn't faring any better either. 
He'd married Myrtle in 1921, and though he was faithful to her, there were problems. Myrtle had developed a chronic drink problem, and he spent a lot of money paying for her care in various uh, establishments. It caused him a lot of heartbreak, and I rather wonder if that might not have influenced him to spending a lot more time socialising the country club, being a gregarious man anyway, of course, was part of that. But who wants to go home when the wife is ill or not even there? You know, I feel as fidgety as a jitterbug. You do? Yeah. What's the matter? Well, I'm nervous. You know, Stanley, this will be the first time I've ever been married. <laughs> Fortune was to smile on Ollie, though when in 1939, on the set of The Flying Deuces, he met and later married script girl Lucille Jones. I'll tell her for you. As script girl, she had responsibility for continuity and that type of thing. And there was an accident on set, she tripped and bashed her head, and um, he'd sent her flowers and she was touched, but she didn't regard it as any more than a friendly professional gesture. What she didn't know was that all this time, this famous comedian was falling in love with him. Out of the blue, he just said, you know, will you marry me? And she accepted, rather impulsively. Then, having accepted the marriage proposal, she went on her first date with him. I mean, he's crazy about you. He's going to marry you. Aunt Jolly, go on, stop copying. You want to marry me? Well, that is, if you don't mind. <laughs> now happily remarried and settled with Lucille, a different Oliver began to emerge. He hated being fat. And uh, it's, it's something that too many people didn't know that because with other people he would just laugh and say, well, that's the way, that's my bread and butter, I, I have to be big, you know, and that, and he would ridicule it in that way. But uh, with me, he would, uh, I knew how he felt and he would many times, he would stand and He'd walk up behind me, for instance, I'd be at my dressing table or I'd be in front of a mirror and he'd walk up behind me and he'd say, look at me, look at me. How could you love a great big fat man like me? I mean, that's, that's something I've never, never told anyone before in my life, but it was, I mean, it's one of those little personal things that do happen between a man and a wife. Both Ollie and Stan's confidence took a further knock when they returned to filmmaking in 1941. Now free of their Hal Roach contract, they signed to 20th Century Fox, full of hope. But although the films they made were financially successful, creatively they were dead in the water. Here they come, the bigwigs of bedlam, the nabobs of nonsense, the headmen of horseplay, the titans of turmoil, Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. All set to take you on a roller coaster of mad mirth in their latest, greatest, and funniest 20th century Fox comedy, The Dancing Masters. For the most part, they aren't very good for the simple reason that they were hired as actors. Suddenly, Stan Laurel was not unofficially directing, he wasn't heading a gag team, he wasn't editing, he wasn't doing anything behind the camera. They were just, for the most part, given scripts by the big studios and told to get on and do it. My foot's gone to sleep. Is there anything I can do to make you comfortable? What are you whispering about? I didn't want to wake your foot up. Oh. The Long Hardy were handed scripts, and they were told to follow the scripts. They never did that. But at MGM and Fox, uh, they had to do it the studio way. Sheer stupidity. When you look at uh, Lolan Hardy's work, you have to say that at least half of it wasn't terribly good. What's the combination of this thing? Two turns to the left. One, two. What do you mean, two turns to the Hold left? Hold this a minute. One, two. I mean, they were wonderful, but the scripts weren't terribly good, the films weren't terribly good.
So, as a consequence, they turned out a series of features that they hated and which damaged their reputation in the film business, at least in the United States. And by 1945, they'd had enough. Stan felt humiliated by their experiences at Fox and MGM. They were by now both middle-aged men, and when the Fox contract ended in 1945, they were ready to finish their film career, after over a hundred films together. But then, in 1946, a surprising job offer came from Europe. Starved of entertainment throughout the war, there was a real public thirst for live theatre. Stan and Ollie were still Europe's biggest comedy double act, and so they toured to packed houses across the continent. They had no idea that the reception was going to be quite as it turned out to be, because as the ship was pulling in, word had gone around that Laurel and Hardy were coming, and all of the church bells started to play their cuckoo theme. And apparently, because they weren't expecting this, they thought, what's all this for? But then they heard their theme and thought, they realised it was for them. And they just looked at each other and cried. There were mobs of people at every station. And they have Laurel and Hardy masks. We'd never seen them. So lining up at the station are all of these people. Half of them are wearing the Laurel masks and half of them Hardy masks. At every station, the train would stop. We found out later what had happened. The engineer had phoned the station ahead and said, Laurel and Hardy are aboard. So the sta train would stop at every station, and here are these mobs of people. They're reaching through the train windows to shake hands, just to touch them. Anything you special want to do over here, Oliver? Nothing but uh, try and make the people happy, and will you keep quiet a minute? and uh, have a good time and have everyone else have a good time I'm talking to the gentleman will you keep quiet just a moment and then I think that uh, after a couple of weeks we might what is it? you're standing on my foot oh, I'm sorry. for the first time Stan and Ollie performed new material live on stage before an adoring public and it was a comp an air of unreality. You couldn't believe it was them. You had some sneaking feeling that we'd all pay and go in and they'd show us a film or something. You couldn't, no, you didn't see people like that. That didn't happen. And uh, on they came. And it, the, the ovation was just astonishing. Uh, it was probably three or four minutes, but seemed 15. I mean, the people were cheering and shouting and the affection for them. And they just stood there. Tears running down Oliver Hardy's face. He couldn't cope with this emotional welcome they got. I'm so glad I saw them. To see those, the, them in real life there in front of you it was an amazing experience. So you were there that night in that audience. Though ignored by Hollywood, Laurel and Hardy were being discovered by a whole new generation of American fans when their comedies were picked up by the new TV networks. But it was still a surprise to many when in 1950, the duo's resurgent popularity led a European film company to commission a new Laurel and Hardy film. Uh, Oliver, we met Stan just a short time ago, a couple of months ago as a matter of fact, and we found out that you and he were back together again in some of those wonderful pictures. Well, we've never been a project. No, that's true, but you know a great many of the people out there in the public have uh, thought that you were a project. Well, that's true, because they've gotten us mixed up with other teams. Mm -hmm. But uh, Stan and I have been together for 23 years, and we're still friends. I think that's a record. That is a record. Atoll K offered much, but eventually proved disastrous. The film of Atoll K was meant to have been shot in 12 weeks. Now, this was good news particularly to uh, two comedians who were getting on in years. By 1950, uh, Stan Laurel was approaching his 60th birthday, Oliver Hardy a couple of years younger, so they weren't exactly in the first flush, so they didn't want anything that was going to be too much of a strain. The strain, however, is what they got. Uh, 12 weeks became 12 months. 
Ollie was the heaviest he'd ever been, while Stan was suffering from diabetes and was so ill for much of the filming that he was unable to exercise the editorial control he so craved. During all this, Stan Laurel's health started to deteriorate rather badly. He finished up undergoing surgery, then needed to put up a small sort of mini hospital unit on the set with his wife acting as nurse. He looked terrible in the film. Do that again. Oh dear, there was Atoll K or something. Oh no, I didn't want to see that. Uh, you know, you want to remember people the way you want to remember them at their peak. Well, here's another nice mess you've gotten me into. Well, I could not be to go over and play with this kind of thing. I would just look at it. When it was finally released in 1953, the film was both a critical and a commercial failure, prompting Stan and Ollie to call a final end to their film career. From now on, they restricted their act to occasional TV appearances. However, yesterday, a bit of film was flown in from Hollywood, which was made by two of our most, well, most important members, the most active members. It speaks for itself, so allow me to introduce Laurel and Hardy. Gee, that's well. What's that? It's a letter from the water rats in England. Oh? They want us to say hello from all the water rats in America. Say, that's nice. Mm. Who, are you going to, who are you going to mention first? Well, let me think. There's Chick York. Chick York. And there was Bobby May. Bobby May. Oh, what a juggler he was. Boy. And last but not least, Daniel Dallinoff and Freddie Morgan. They all send greetings. Goodbye, Brother Water Rats, and our many friends and fans. Good luck, and God bless you all. We'll never forget you. That's right, Stanley. We never shall. Goodbye. It was to be a poignant farewell to their fans, as it proved to be their last TV appearance. Like Stan's, Ollie's health also began to fail. Diagnosed with a heart condition, he was put on a crash diet, eventually shedding 150 pounds. Despite Ollie's illness, Stan was still hopeful of reviving the Laurel and Hardy name. Hal Roach Jr., who'd taken over his dad's old studio, invited them to make a new series of colour films for television based on fairy tales, uh, to be known either as uh, The Fables of Laurel and Hardy or Laurel and Hardy's Fabulous Fables. And Stan had written several uh, initial scripts for them as uh, playing characters out of Mother Goose. Then uh, the dreadful thing happened. Um, Oliver Hardy uh, got a, a stroke, of a devastating one. Ollie suffered a crippling stroke in September 1956. He battled on for nearly a year before finally succumbing to a series of convulsive strokes. He died on the 7th of August 1957. His body was cremated and his ashes interred at the Garden of Hope at the Valhalla Memorial Park. Stan is plunged into sorrow on two counts. His uh, dear friend and uh, co-worker and co-creator is gone and um, the team of Laurel and Hardy is gone forever. We're at the Oceana Apartments in Santa Monica. This was Stan Laurel's final home. Uh, at this apartment, he lived with his wife, Ida. And if you look up on the second floor balcony, this is where Stan would view the beautiful Pacific Ocean. And he was very happy there because he could watch his beloved sea. And he said, I keep very occupied watching the sea. He said, nothing ever happens, but uh, I like watching the sea. Stan missed the old days and would spend hours responding in person to letters from adoring fans. He also had time to indulge in a rather odd hobby. He would go out to a stationery shop and tour it, rather. He would go through every aisle, up and down, looking at all the things, appreciating them and making uh, little notes to himself. 
And in one instance, we went to a stationery shop in Santa Monica, and the man behind the counter looked quickly as Stan came in, and his eyes followed him as Stan went around looking in. I said, may I help you? And Stan said, well, oh, I'm just looking at the moment. The fellow was certain he knew who that was. He said, I know you. You are, um, uh, and Stan said, Oliver Hardy. And the guy said, right. Gee, Mr. Hardy, are you and, uh, and your friend, you, you and Mr. Laurel, you were so great. I mean, you're still great. I, I watch your movies all the time. Oh, Mr. Hardy, I can't tell you the laughs that you've given me. And then he paused and he said, oh, uh, by the way, uh, whatever happened to Mr. Laurel? And Stan said very solemnly, he went by me. In 1961, Stan received an honorary Oscar for his life's work, even though he'd not made a film for over ten years. At that time, he had stopped making movies. And uh, you would think that, well, uh, Hardy is gone, so there's no more Laurel and Hardy, as, as Stan said. But uh, there he was. He said, uh, I'll go on creating those gags until the day I die, which indeed he did. On the 23rd of February, 1965, Stan suffered a massive heart attack and died. His funeral at the Church of the Hills in Forest Lawns, Los Angeles, was a star-studded affair. Stan was laid to rest, looking out over the valley below. But the story of Laurel and Hardy doesn't end there. In Stan's hometown of Ulverston, there's a museum dedicated to their work. Their memory is kept alive by legions of adoring fans throughout the world, who gather regularly to watch old movies and reminisce at the genius that was Laurel and Hardy. Their comedy is timeless, and uh, they are the eternal everyman, um, suffering at the hands of malevolent fate. Um, they are, you know, uh, and they're funny, of course, um, which is a good... Uh, yeah. Laurel and Hardy just encompass everything that's great about comedy. They're fantastic. Laurel and Hardy are easily the, the greatest comedy team that ever lived. I think most of us who have worked in comedy are consistently influenced by the voices of the preceding generations. Even if people haven't been directly influenced by Stan Laurel, they've been influenced by someone who's been influenced by someone who's been influenced by Stan Laurel. I think I'd be Ollie, yeah, I'd be Ollie who was always affronted dignity and everything. I'm always into things and trying to behave as if I meant to do it anyway. I would consider Laurel and Hardy both geniuses. They both contributed to Laurel and Hardy, an institution, and so I would say geniuses, or is it genius high? Whatever the plural of geniuses is. is. Shine on, shine on, harvest moon, up in the sky. I ain't had no loving since January, April, June or July.